This time I got a Technics 5 disc CD changer. I know you're going to be fooled when you see the video and it says Harman Kardon on the front. It's really a Technics. But it's sold as a Harman Kardon TL8500. Doesn't play. Let's check it out. This time I've got a 5 disc. This is a Harman Kardon CD player. Don't know what the fault is, so let's just load up some discs and see what it does. And there's another disc that's under here. I should be able to rotate this. Button to rotate it. Let's see here. How do I do this? That. Well, I guess that's supposed to turn it, but it doesn't. Or is it disc skip? Disc skip. Okay, so it doesn't appear to be doing anything. What about if I press play? Okay, so I think we know the problem on this. It's um, it's not doing anything. When I press the buttons on the front, nothing's rotating. It's totally dead, other than the display lighting up. But none of the buttons do anything. Oh, it's telling it it's going to play disc number one, but it's not uh, doing anything. Now it won't even attempt to play anything. If I turn it off, turn it on, watch when I press the play button, you'll see something light up on here. If I press the disc, Let's repeat. Where's my disk skip? Disk skip. Let's see? Error. E comes up. So this one's got a problem. While I do that, while I unload all my disks, I'm going to remind people, if you're shipping me something to repair, because I get a lot of things that are shipped in, and this just happened again today. And I, I can't stress this enough. If you are shipping me something for repair, and it's coming from a country other than Canada. In other words, the United States. It must be shipped in as no declared value, or zero dollars, or it is being shipped in for repair. It cannot be shipped in as, uh, under any other declaration, which incidentally, that is the correct declaration. It is broken, it is coming in for an attempted repair. That will not generate any taxes or duties or any other types of charges if it's shipped in via USPS. If you send it by FedEx or by UPS or by DHL, then yes, you will be paying shipping and handling fees or they will send me the bill for the shipping and handling fees and I will send that bill back to you. I would say at least DHL and UPS won't drop it at my door. FedEx will drop it at my door and then send me the bill. And if I don't pay it, they send it to collections, which pisses me off. Post office is the same. If there's any declared value, it doesn't matter how little it is. Well, actually it does. If it's declared at $20 or less, it sales through. Anything over $20, they are going to assess GST, which is the goods and services tax, and then they're going to assess provincial sales tax and then there's also going to be a broker fee added on top of that. No different than if someone buys something off eBay. If I'm buying something from the States and having it shipped to me and importing something, I have to pay tax on it. Anytime you bring something in to the country, you pay tax. If you buy something in the store, you pay GST and PST. That's just the way it is. So if you import something, you're paying the federal and provincial taxes, regardless whether you buy it domestically or import it from another country. The exception to the rule is if something is broken and it's being shipped into Canada to be repaired so that it can be shipped back to the United States. Then there are no charges. But yet again today, I get notification from the post office that there's a package waiting for me and I go to pick it up and I get there and surprise, it has a $30 charge on it. So now I have to collect the $30 from the person that sent it to me, make another trip back to the post office to pick it up, and then go through the whole process of repairing and shipping it back, which just means an extra trip for me to the post office. 
which didn't need to happen. Anyway, I'm re the reason I'm rambling about that is because this happens all the time. I had one guy sent me a Walkman and he put a declared value of $1,000 on a broken Walkman. That triggered $165 in taxes, which he paid. So now he's, he just paid an extra $165 in taxes. This is happening all the time. And I, so, just so you guys watching, any of you that want to send me something from the States, don't put a declared value on it because you're going to be paying for it, not me. Now, in case you're wondering what happens if I don't pay the taxes and so forth on it, what happens then is the post office will hang on to it for about two weeks. If I don't pick something up, then what happens is uh, after, I think it's 14 days, it will be returned to the sender at their expense, which means they'll pay the shipping to get it back. They won't have to pay the tax, but they will pay the shipping to get it back unrepaired. That's what happens. I'm gonna try removing the bottom cover on this one. I think the bottom comes off on this. So the screws are removed and the screws for the feet, the bottom is shipped off. Three of the feet are long and one of them is not. Okay, now that the bottom's off, we can get a better look at the inner workings of this unit. The belt is not broken. I can see the belt right down here and it is not broken. Okay, so now it's, it's turning. Yeah, I think that belt is slipping. Yeah, that's what's happening. This belt is slipping. So, even though it's not damaged, like it's not it's not falling apart, it is slipping. So we're going to change the belt out. And this one should not be that difficult. I think I can probably do it without having to even take the machine apart. I can do it right from here. This could even be even easier than that. I got enough room here. I don't have to take anything apart on here to take this belt off. All I need to do is just lift it off. Ah! Who would have thunk it was that simple? Let me go find one that's a reasonable facsimile to this one but not quite as slippery. All right, got another little belt here. This one's not quite as thick as the other one, but I think it's probably gonna be okay for what it's gonna do. It's just going to uh, turn this pulley. I tell you, my day today has been totally wasted. I, um, I don't like it when my days get wasted by people that make mistakes and you know do incompetent things. I wouldn't say it really was incompetent, but it was still a mistake that was made that should have been checked before I left, considering it's like it, it's like an hour and a bit drive each way to the Harley Davidson dealership to get parts for my bike. The part that I fixed last week, the shifter, which I fixed up, the back side of the shifter, which was this piece here. So this piece broke before, and I, I glued this piece before. This isn't the one that I just glued. The one that I just glued was the front part, this one. Well, this other one was glued about, I'm going to say, maybe seven or eight years ago. This was done a long time ago, and it started to get loose again because the the shaft that it sits on here, the uh, splines on them start to wear out just over the years. This is the other one. See, it's not worn. The front part's not worn at all. It was just it was a bit loose. So I bought the new uh, I bought the new shaft. Put the shaft on. I went in with my part. Here's my part, and they gave me one that is totally different. It was all packaged up in this nice package that you can't see through. So I got all the way home, going to put it on my bike anticipating going out on a ride. See I want to change it because um, I don't want it to break 
when I'm out on the road. I don't want, this is the inner shaft and I don't want this thing to break and it started to get loose again and wouldn't tighten up and I knew that I had repaired this one before so I figured okay for what the part cost I'll go get the parts and, and do it. So I went and picked up the parts and uh, as I say you can see it's not the right length. So now I gotta make another trip back. As soon as I get enough charge in the battery of my car I gotta make another trip back. I don't have quite enough charge to make another round trip. It's, uh, it's about 80 kilometers round trip and I get on my battery before, I don't want to use gas, right? I don't want the gas engine to start, but I can usually get around 95 kilometers or so of range. And when I arrived home, it said I had 20 remaining. So it's like, okay, I gotta, I gotta charge up for a, a couple of hours just so I can turn around and go back right in the middle of rush hour. So I'll be leaving here in about an hour. The rate I'm going on this, I'll have this all fixed up and be ready to make the trip back. So let's see what happens when I plug it in now. Hit the button. Over here. That's interesting. It's still jamming. Why is it jamming? Well, probably because this is in the wrong position. That might explain why. Okay. So let's just turn it over and see if it works. I'll just drop a couple of discs in. I don't need to load it up. And uh, hit play. Will it play? Will it play? It's thinking. Oh. Well, I don't know if it's reading or not. It tells me there's a disc in place. It may not like CDRs, who knows? Should play them. Now, uh, error, still not reading. Hmm, what else is wrong? What it appears is happening is that it's not detecting whether this is up or down. Sticky silicon grease on here very sticky stuff but it, there should be a switch that detects when this is up or down and this is a Technics uh, player this unit it says Technics right on here this is a Technics uh, uh, traverse on this unit but there should be a switch that indicates that the, that the unit is up or down it's gonna find it because it I was watching it when it loaded it it actually it actually went like this. It, it, the motor, when the motor turned around, and which way did it turn? It turned the gear clockwise. So it went. It went like this. And when it chucked the disc, rather than stop here, it continued on like that. I think I see the problem. Do you guys see the problem? How about now? Let me give you a clue. It's blue. Oh, did I just say blue clue? I think there was a kid's show called that that my kids used to watch. Um, okay, so there's a little sensor switch down here that detects when the, uh, the the elevator gear is either in the loaded or unloaded position, and I bet you that that little switch is not signaling the microprocessor properly, and that is what's causing the problem. So to fix that, we're going to have to get our, our hands dirty and get into this just disgusting I hate this glue this is the stuff that they use to dampen uh, turntables it's like a silicon oil very very thick about 110 weight maybe 120 weight it's like molasses um, anyway uh, the stuff is very gooey and sticky it's a silicon oil lubricant and um, well I gotta take that out of here because I gotta get to the switch that's below there so let's just pop this thing off and sure I'm unplugged here first of all so that it doesn't try to do something. We'll just pop this clip off and uh, I'll get my hands dirty. Yuck, yuck, okay. That's out of the way. All right, this is the switch here. I think the switch here is probably needing to be cleaned. You see, it's a little lever switch. 
what it does is when the cam gear rotates it flicks a switch on the bottom here and that signals the unit to, as to whether the disc is in the correct position or not. All right, so of course I've always got the wrong bit. that screw, remove the switch, and we'll get in here with some neutral and soak the switch with the cleaner, see if we can get it to clean up. And incidentally, just because this unit says Harman Kardon on it, their forward command to Harman Kardon price. It's not a Harman Kardon, it's a Technics. Technics had exactly the same player. Okay, you can find this, I've seen this one in thrift stores for like $15, the top loading CD changer. This was Technics answer to Sony's exchange of disc where you could push a button and the tray popped out halfway and you could swap the other four. On the, this model, you could just open the top and it will continue to play and um, change your other discs. The only downside to this design of player, of course, is this was came from the era where nobody had a turntable anymore. So they had their nice big stereo stand, which used to have the, the turntable on top, right? And of course, everybody ditched their, their turntable. So they decided that, hey, that's a great place to put a CD player. Let's make a CD player that holds five discs and that you can just change the discs at will. And this was the result. Don't forget your switch spacer. Okay, that's back on. Now, put this greasy cam gear back in place. And then we gotta we gotta pull the switch into position. Otherwise it won't drop into place. If I rotate this, it'll probably do it. There we go. Now it's in place. Put the washer back on and the clip. And then go and clean my hands because everything's gonna stick to me. You see this stuff's very, very sticky. Okay, now this should, and then when it goes down, oops, did I miss something? I think I missed this, this side. Lifts up. Okay, power is on, and see if it will load a disc, and it should go all the way around, and push play, it should figure out which one's got a disc in it, and load it, and play it. I heard it load. Okay, it's got a reading problem as well. We'll try a different type of desk. It might not like CDRs. These are pretty old, these units. All right, so there were a number of CD players, the early ones, that did not like CDRs. 
CDRs. So now it's, what it's doing is it's doing a scan to see where there are discs. And it'll stop and it'll load this one up and it should play if the traverse is going to work. And it still doesn't work. So it's not reading this CDR either. We'll try a couple stamped discs and see if it helps. A couple of stamped discs. Who am I fooling? I only have to put one in. If it doesn't play one, then it's got a prop. Then we got to investigate and see why. It's still not working. The disc does not appear to even attempt to spin. So we have other problems other than a bad belt. So this time I'll pull the traverse out with just a check of power and uh, just one screw and the whole traverse here should lift right out. Of course, I always got the wrong size screwdriver. Every time I pick one up, it's the wrong one for what I really need. Screw. Little optical to first lift out just like that. Oh yeah, there's something on here on this clamp. This is an old, a very old setup. We can tell by all these adjustments. To set one of these ones up, there was a jig. This is first generation. To set one of these players up, there was actually a jig that was available that we actually purchased when I worked at the service center. We had to buy one. It was $1,700 to set one of these up. It uh, plugged in here and you hooked up your scope to a couple test points. There was One was there and that was the ground. And the, the jig plugged in over here and it had uh, it had lights and stuff on it that you would adjust these until certain lights lit up. It had like a low, high, and middle and you would adjust them until the right light lit up. And of course while monitoring the uh, RF and um, yeah, they were, say this was early, early optics. This has got a lot of dust on it so maybe the lens is just dirty. We'll try cleaning the lens off. You can see all the dust that just wiped off this downside to this type of design is being open like this is that dust could get into it and it did but you can see if we look here look at, look at the dust on here see this is really really dirty so it, it's it's possible that it's just you know it's not the traverse sticking that's for sure it could have a bad laser could have a bad spindle motor they were common on these there's crap on this here but that shouldn't affect it it looked like looked like some of this silicon oil had dripped in onto here um it could be a bad, say, it could be a bad optical pickup that's causing it. But we'll try cleaning it first and, and then see what all we can do is to try cleaning it. So this unit, vintage 1991, they only used this design for, I think, two years. Or maybe three, 89, 90, 91, and then the next generation laser was developed and the next generation laser none of these controls it was digital servo and that seventeen hundred dollar piece of equipment that Panasonic insisted that we purchase to maintain our status as a warranty repair shop well that was now a useless piece of hardware because once all the units were beyond warranty Nobody was fixing them, right? People, even back then, were not spending money on fixing CD players, just like today. <laughs> uh, but today, it's everything. But uh, people were not spending money back then. Uh, if you had a CD player, because the price of CD players kept dropping, right? If you had a, if you had a CD player that uh, the laser or something or the traverse was shot, well, we changed the entire traverse on the ones that had the. Uh, the, the digital um, tracking we would change the entire traverse and the traverse uh, you just undid the little board here and plugged the laser into it and it came with the motors and everything it was that it was that top piece it had the uh, it had the spin motor and the linear motor and everything was all part of that traverse and that was changed 
and if it was warranty when it when we got to the when we got over to the the digital units with digital tracking and stuff if the traverse was bad and it was under warranty the entire optical block was changed if it was past warranty then generally people bought a new one just as they do now uh, okay laser is cleaned we'll try it again and see if it will read fingers crossed that we'll have a little better luck this time and that that's all it was because if it's more than that then there's a good chance that the fault is going to be the optical pickup is no good so load a disc hit play I don't have no sound. There we go. It's playing. Excellent. Let's see how it plays my CDRs. If it plays the CDRs, well, it wouldn't play anything before, but if it plays the CDRs without complaining, then uh, I think we're probably okay. So play. That's the same disc, by the way. With the running stream, if I hit skip disc, it should move to the next disc. Well, you can see it's having trouble with that disc. Let's try another one. The laser is likely weak. Yeah, but then this is a on the dark lasers and it's a lot of scratches on this disc so that may have been probably the problem it doesn't want to read this disc at all which again does not surprise me because it's an early CD player and a lot of the early CD players just did not play CDRs like they just did not play them at all and the reason the CDR did not hit the market until when, when did CDR come out 1990 91 somewhere in there anyway for CD players manufactured before there was CDRs there was no requirement for them to play a product that no that did not exist at that point in time so let's just put some regular discs in it Gotta find my regular discs. Okay, next disc. skipping tracks there's 12 tracks on this is track 9 10 11 12. Now we'll skip to the next disc. Amazon truck just pulled up in front of my house. It's <laughs> going to the neighbors.
15 tracks on this. This is track 10. I picture you in the sun. 11. 13, 14, and 15. Okay, I think I can uh, safely say that this unit is working. It's not going to play CDRs, we know that. It wouldn't play either type of CDR, but again, not unexpected considering that this unit was around long before CDRs even existed. So I think it's safe to put this one back together. Just stop it. And hit disk skip. See when that when that when it's released the disk you can rotate this and it doesn't hurt it. And it will automatically lock it. So let's put the bottom on this one. Perfect timing too. 3.30 by the time I get this done and ready to go, I can head out there and pick up the parts for my bike. I can get it back on the road and go for a nice ride. It's a nice day. Been waiting, all. I was gonna be doing this today when it was nice out, but I'd get a nice evening ride, I guess. But unfortunately, having to make a second trip back to the big city and waste another, I don't know, two and a half hours of my time probably be longer than that because I'll be heading in there in rush hour so I'm going to be heading in in rush hour and coming home in rush hour be dinner time by the time I get back and beyond if it sounds like I'm annoyed I, I guess I am a little bit and because um, the guy looked up the part in the paper manual because they have everything on paper books and he pointed at the part and goes there it is there and he looked up at the figure number and then uh, proceeded to um, pick up the wrong part. I don't know whether, whether he looked at the... Uh, I figure probably what happened was he, he, his eye skipped a line and, and um, looked at the part and then when he looked over at the, at, the, um, at the parts list he got the next one over because the the lever that I've got is actually the one that goes right that bolts onto the motor not to the uh, not to the selector shaft. It's the one that goes into the transmission that this one connects with. Anybody that knows Harleys know what I'm talking about. The guys that ride Harleys are nodding because they probably had to change this part. Because it is, uh, as they say, a part that does wear. It gets a lot of abuse, especially when you stamp on it with your foot to change gears. Like if you're accelerating in a hurry and you're going through the gears, you tend to uh, sometimes hit the gear shifter just a little bit hard sometimes someone's trying to sell you a Harman Kardon go like that this little, little uh, indentation faces in someone's trying to sell you a Harman Kardon uh, CD player like this Keep in mind, it's a Technics CD player. It's not a Harman Kardon. And uh, pay accordingly for what you would pay for a Technics unit. Don't uh, don't get sucked into the hype. Oh, this is a Harman Kardon. These are rare. They're worth a lot of money. Just think of it as it's a Technics unit because that's what it is. And pay accordingly what you would pay for a Technics unit. In other words, about $15. That's what one of these would sell for in the second-hand store. Between $15 and $25 is what something like this would go for under the Technics brand. Under the Harman Kardon brand, I guess it's whatever someone's going to pay for it because if someone's looking for something to match their system or they're looking for a specific name some people are going to pay a lot more than it's worth but uh, just keep that in mind that uh, it's a Technics player
Let's uh, see how it handles a CD that's got 100 sound effects on it. I recognize that knock that's used on a commercial. <laughs> Now the reason I'm going through all these tracks is to make sure it can actually track them all. Busy tone? Or that? How many people know what that is? How about this one? Try to guess the sounds. Pretty obvious. That one's pretty obvious too.
bet it won't get to 100. I bet it'll stop at 99. Seven in this track. If track ninety nine, it won't go to one hundred. It should play it automatically once we get to the thirty second point. Each track is 30 seconds, so if I skip ahead, ah, index, watch the index. Index is going to go to number two right here when we hit 30 seconds. So if I lift this up so you guys can see the index, and this is something that's very seldom used. Track 99, index two. And that's because the CD has a physical limitation of 100 tracks, or 99 tracks actually. So anything beyond 99 has to be done as indexes. Index is a feature I wish they'd use more often, and the only the only CD that I actually own that has index on it is one of the Mannheim Steamroller Fresh Air Discs. Okay, it's got that same grease that dampens the uh, lid opening. And then we can retrieve the disc and shut this one down yeah if you turn if you move it too quick it'll actually skip teeth that will probably free up a bit once it's opened and closed a few times this thing's obviously been sitting for an awful long time and that that silicon oil has really got gummy but there see now it's opening a little quicker that's a little more like it and the same thing is, can be said for if you've got an old turntable that you know that hasn't been used in a long time, the dampening oil for the arm, the cueing arm, will likely get thick and gooey like this. But if you just operate it a few times, now as you can see, it's going to open properly, and it won't do that skipping teeth when I close it. That was just because the the, the oil had dried up, the silicon oil had gotten really really thick. But there we go. Okay, this one's fixed. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one. Bye.